we are live you can start if you're ready thank you um i'm ready okay. and um so oh. uh, very good evening to everyone okay a uh, very good evening to everyone i'm naita san paruki the director of international relations of community of biotechnology cob is basically a non profit organization for student bodies in fields of biological sciences helping webinars throughout the past few months to keep everyone connected to their fields and so our topic for today is rather interesting entitled future prospects of synthetic biology now synthetic biology is a field of science that involves the redesigning of organisms for useful purposes by engineering them to have new abilities synthetic biology researchers to solve problems in medicine manufacturing and agriculture to understand this topic better and probable future prospects of synthetic biology today we have with us a very special guest who holds an expertise in this field dr kate adamar dr kate is current assistant professor in the delhi university of minnesota you are the biochemist towards the engineering of synthetic cells her research aims at understanding the chemical principles of biology using artificial cells to create new tools for bioengineering drug development and basic research her work also includes contributions to the fields of astrobiology synthetic cell engineering as well as biocomputing one of the most significant contributions to rna replication which provided an experimental scenario for the rna world hypothesis of the origin of life apart from her contributions in various fields she is also the founder and a steering group member of the initiative build a cell and the co-founder of cell life now before i give up the floor to kate i would like to thank her for making time for this early morning session since she joined us at 9 am central time in the usa despite having such a busy schedule thank you kate and uh, with that being said you may start of the session Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Narita, for introduction, and thanks, everyone. Um, it's pleasure to talk to you. Um, I think one of the paradoxically good things about the pandemic is that we get to talk to more people that we normally wouldn't be able to talk to, because I mean there would be no way for me to travel for this seminar. But since we can meet online, um, we can do. things that normally would be very hard to do um i still miss in person meetings obviously as we probably all do but it's really interesting to be able to kind of interact with international community interact with more people and have more people attend seminars and attend meetings that we would um normally under the in person travel circumstances have um really hard time um going to everything it's just not possible So thank you for having me and uh what I want to talk about today is um then kind of a next frontier in synthetic biology uh building cells from scratch um building cells so you can uh understand how natural cells work but also <clears throat> building cells so we can have more examples of cells more kind of types in which biology can work So as a biochemist what we do is we're looking at this incredibly complex natural cells and we're thinking about how to modify it and how to understand um how it works. So when you um look at the incredible diversity of life around us um you know that there's so many different forms of living organisms there's this incredible diversity. But looking at it closely It's really hard to believe that there from the scientific point of view there is only one life form on earth right now. Um one life form which means one type of biology. So the biochemistry of living processes is the same in all known um life. The blueprint of all living cells is the same. And looking at the molecular level 
all cells in every organism we ever known living on Earth uh, will have the same strategy for storing genetic information, um, for growing and for making all the proteins and for performing their metabolism. We still don't fully understand how even that one type of cells really works uh, because cells, natural cells are so incredibly complex. And they're so crowded with proteins and nucleic acids and all the small molecules that we don't have a fully functional map of a cell right now. And we spent millions of people years so far uh, studying biochemistry. When you think about that, this is pretty much all that biological science has been doing for the last couple centuries, ever since the origin of the modern scientific method, is we were trying to study biochemistry of a living cell. And we still don't have a complete map of even a single type of a living cell. So when you have something so complex, um, how would you go about understanding it? How would you go about changing it, rearranging it, and making kind of new variations on the same plan? How would you go about studying something that you can't take apart um, and study it in kind of a first principles? Well, one way to go about it is to make this thing simpler. And that's the whole point of the field of synthetic cell engineering. We can build simplest living cells from scratch. And the guiding principle of our field um, is a quote from a brilliant physicist, Richard Feynman, who said, um, what I cannot create, I do not understand. That means the importance of hands-on approach to solving problems. You have to make it yourself so you really know how it's made. And synthetic cells are bringing the principles of engineering into biology. Um, we can make cells with full control of all of its parts, uh, just like engineering a mechanical device. And in many ways, you can think of a synthetic cell um, as a biological breadboard or a prototyping board, um, a platform to get test different designs and to engineer novel biological systems. And so the anatomy of most synthetic cells is fundamentally not that different from all non-living cells. They're lipid containers expressing genes into proteins. So the cell is surrounded by a lipid membrane, and most of the time that membrane is made of the same kind of lipids as natural cells, um, phospholipids and cholesterol. So lipids have a polar hydrophilic head group and a non-polar hydrophobic tail. And despite its bad reputation, um, cholesterol is actually good for membranes. Um, it makes them flexible. I know doctors tell us we shouldn't like cholesterol as people, but cholesterol actually makes biological membranes flexible and resistant to kind of physical to, to those kind of physical deformations that cells have to deal with um, during the course of growth and division. So the membrane of cell, synthetic cells often has channels. Uh, which are proteins that allow transport of nutrients and signals uh, from the outside and the removal of waste products uh, from the inside. And uh, in synthetic cells, we usually use uh, simple channels that create um, rather non-specific holes in a membrane. And one of the most common channels is one called alpha chemolysin, uh, which is originally a bacterial toxin that we repurposed for synthetic cell research. Since the main point of having a membrane is to separate the cell from the environment, so the inside of a synthetic cell uh, from the outside, you can imagine a synthetic cell made of a droplet, a drop of water surrounded by an oil phase. And millions of droplets can be made um, at the same time in the droplet microfluidic systems. And so in a droplet, you can't use a membrane channel since there's no membrane, but um, for other applications, the microfluidic systems are widely used to make different kinds of synthetic cells for different purposes, for studying synthetic cell metabolism or for um, kind of making more variations of different kinds of lineages of synthetic cells. And regardless of how it's done, um, the compartment is the relatively simple problem. The really interesting stuff is what's going on inside the synthetic cell. So the genes, the protein expression system, and the metabolism, so the guts of the cell. And um, like natural life, synthetic cells express proteins from DNA genomes. And those genomes are usually relatively simple, up to a dozen genes at a time right now. 
And to look at the scale of engineering we're talking about, um, I want to show you kind of a brief overview of the scales of engineering in synthetic biology in general and in building cells from scratch in particular. So we have about 20,000 genes, um, plus minus few, depending on um, how you count. Um, bacteria have about an order of magnitude less genes. First, live organism with a completely synthetic genome has 400, 474 genes. It's an artificially built genome of a mycoplasma laboratorium, the mycoplasma derived synthetic cell. Um, and then our non living synthetic minimal cells usually have about a dozen genes. So you can see there's a lot of room for engineering larger synthetic cell genomes and a lot of kind of technical progress that uh, we need to make to get there. And so to make a complete cell, uh, genes need to be expressed into proteins. In synthetic cells, uh, protein expression is done by in vitro translation system. Actually, most of the proteins and small molecules in a synthetic cell are employed in a translation processes. So most of what you see inside most cells, both synthetic and natural, are proteins that belong to the translation system. Cells are just lousy with ribosomes, and so are synthetic cells. The in vitro translation system uh, contains ribosomes, tRNA, RNA polymerases to make mRNA, enzymes to load amino acids into tRNA, and all the small molecules are needed for translation. All those components are purified and then recombined to encapsulate inside the synthetic cell, uh, creating a synthetic cell cytoplasm. And the most commonly used in vitro translation system is components purified from bacteria, mostly e coli, most of the time E. coli. It's possible to use um, many different source organisms though, um, and all the way up to the human cell derived protein expression system. And the bacterial system is used because it's the fastest and cheapest one to work with, and other organisms are used uh, when we need to express more complex genes or post-translational modifications of proteins. And this is one of the main reasons why synthetic cells can be taught as jigsaw puzzle, because the protein expression and metabolism can come from any number of different organisms to build a hybrid cell that combines properties of different kinds of metabolism. And a complete synthetic cell, a membrane surrounding protein expression system is not alive, not yet at least. And that's why we're talking about the future of bioengineering here. Um, we're building those cells from scratch. We're building um, cell-like systems from scratch, but right now they're not yet living. And I'll show you in a moment um, what can we do to get there and what are the uses of this technology. So the synthetic cell performs some, but not all functions of live cells. And it's currently one of the fastest growing areas of research. And just to give you a little bit more perspective on our field, um, I want to highlight main research directions and some applications of synthetic cell technologies. So I introduced synthetic minimal cells, um, which are those um, non-living um, kind of cell-like entities, um, biochemical reactors that have some but not all functions of cells. Um, another type of synthetic cells uh, was also built. This is the synthetic mycoplasma cell that I mentioned before. And that one is actually alive. The Craigventer Institute of Synthetic Bacteria is known as JCVI syn cells. Um, they're cells derived from natural living bacteria, the mycoplasma. And the bacteria have one of those bacteria, mycoplasma, have one of the smallest possible living genomes. And that genome was further minimized to remove everything that was not absolutely crucial uh, for survival of the bug. And the smallest cell is still living, but we don't know the entire list of proteins and molecules that make that cell. So while synthetic, the JCVI syn cells are not yet uh, fully understood. And on the other hand, the non-living synthetic minimal cells are made from a list of very well-defined components. So this is the engineering part of the bioengineering. We, we know every single component that goes into a um, synthetic cell. They're um, not ca yet capable of independent life, but we can understand them like no other biological system. And we can also engineer them as needed. 
And so these are the two kind of fundamentally different approaches to engineering cells these days. The top-down approach of taking living cells and making them simpler to the point where we can actually understand the cell. And then the bottom-up approach of taking known, well-defined, non-living components and putting them together into kind of more complex system that will eventually become alive. And neither of those approaches produced a fully controllable living cell yet. A top-down synthetic cell is alive, but not fully understood. And a bottom-up synthetic cell is completely known, but not yet alive. And so this is where we are today. And the goal of synthetic cell engineering and synthetic biology in general is to have those two approaches meet in the middle to make a living but fully understood cell. And this is basically, um, I'm not done yet, but this is basically where I could end this talk right now. This is the future of synthetic biology, building cells that we can actually understand. Um, all of the areas of bioengineering, of um, biodesign, biomanufacturing, they all rely on this principle that we have cells that we understand. And we don't right now, we don't have cells that we understand. So this is kind of where hopefully the future will help will come is that um, we'll build a synthetic cell that's fully understandable, fully controllable, but as robust and as independent as natural living cells. And then with that kind of biological chassis, we can go on and build other applications and do um, kind of other uh, things that synthetic biology is doing now. So just to give you kind of an overview of where the field is right now and where the field is going, um, some of the advantages of using synthetic cells is that it's safer, faster, and cheaper to work with that system than with uh, natural cells. So because synthetic cells are made of biochemical components and they're not yet alive, um, you don't need to treat them as genetically modified organisms. So biosafety rules for this area of research are much less strict. Um, experiments take much less time because you can iterate the design faster. Um, those cells are engineered and built uh, so you don't have to wait for a culture to grow, for example. And then experiments are also cheaper, which comes from the faster turnaround time and less biosafety constraints. And a lot of uh, biology research suffers from low reproducibility and from difficulty of distinguishing signal to noise. Um, this is mostly because no two natural cells are ever alike, and even genetically identical cells will end up being just a little bit different from each other with changes accumulated during their lifetime. So when you're measuring any signal from natural cells, you will get a lot of noise. But synthetic engineered cells uh, created together are identical. So any measurement done on a synthetic cell is much more precise. And that's why uh, when we want to measure a change in an experiment, it's easier to identify the signal we're looking for in a simpler kind of synthetic cell system because every signal rises above the noise. And if there's less noise, then you can identify the signal much clearer. That's why synthetic cells um, are a great tool for not just biotechnology, but also for basic research. You can study biological processes without background of a lot of those endogenous processes that we still can't really understand. And another good thing about the fact that um, synthetic cells can be made according to a precise recipe is that if you have a recipe, you can digitize it. So no complex life cell can be so completely described because we don't know the composition of any other biological system as well as we know what goes into a synthetic cell. So digital information can be sent across large distances. So it's possible to send information about making a particular synthetic cell to a remote location, for example, for making drugs on demand. Um, and if you can send something across a large distance, then um, you can also imagine sending information uh, to really remote locations, like a spaceship or a Mars colony. Uh, to make urgent, either urgently needed drug or a biological test. And this so-called astropharmacy is not the only area of applications of synthetic cells for space exploration, obviously, um, but it's one of the play, one of the areas that it's growing um, kind of the fastest right now because we don't have a platform for building drugs on demand on short notice um, elsewhere, uh, uh, 
away from kind of a complex, well-equipped lab. Um, and with synthetic cells, um, we can make simplest possible lifelike models and study the conditions and processes necessary for the origin of life. So that's where the astrobiology part comes in. Both on Earth and elsewhere in the solar system, we can study how life could start. We can study and uh, synth synthetic cells that look like prebiotic cells, look like cells that could have originated under different conditions. Um, you all probably heard um, this uh, big kind of a internationally famous an announcement that happened last week um, where they found molecules on Venus that some people speculate could be biosignatures. Um, one of the ways to confirm that this really is a biosignature and there is life on Venus would be obviously to go out there and get a sample, which I believe eventually we will. But for now, since um, we're not going to Venus anytime soon, um, what we can do is we can reconstitute processes of another planet and that it be Venus or um, Enceladus or Europa, we can reconstitute those conditions in the lab and try to build cells that can survive a life that can originate under those conditions. And that can give us um, a lot of information about abundance of life in a solar system or kind of a more generally abundance of life or prob probability of abundance of life elsewhere um, in the universe. And the ability to make those custom synthetic cells um, producing a specific small molecule or protein can also be used for making drugs um, on Earth for terrestrial applications. Um, I talked about astropharmacy applications, but since this is a little ways ahead, there is an application right now where we can use synthetic cells to actually um, kind of make drugs on demand um, in the lab. Why would you like to make drugs um, on demand in the lab? Where right now, uh, to make a biologically produced drug, like a protein or a complex natural product, live cells are set up in those large bioreactors, uh, most often bacteria or yeast making that drug. And it takes a lot of work to engineer a strain of live cells producing certain molecules, mostly because live, cells com live cell complexity makes it hard to insert new metabolic pathways into the cell and then to make the product out and purify it. Um, so drugs are made in big batches um, for large populations of patients. So you basically define a need in a patient uh, population, and then you make drugs for that huge population of patients. Um, and that's where the term orphan drugs comes in, where there are drugs where the patient population is small enough that this large scale model is not really financially viable. And that's why we have those incentives for companies to work on orphan drugs. And it's not um, as easy to develop a drug for a smaller patient population. And um, with synthetic cells being simpler and easier to engineer for production of specific molecules, it might become possible to make custom drugs on demand in small doses for small populations of patients or even for one person. Uh, this makes it possible to imagine personalized medicine approach to, to treating infections, cancers, um, or metabolic syndromes, um, or uh, any other disease. Or even, for example, for making vaccines on demand. Um, we all probably heard this discussion right now that even when um, the coronavirus vaccines are finally approved, there will be a pipeline bottleneck. Um, it will take time to make enough vaccine for um, to vaccinate everyone who needs it. If we have the portable kind of on-demand biomanufacturing bio platform, you could imagine distributed cloud biomanufacturing, where instead of making all doses of a drug in one lab, you spread it. You make as many doses of a drug as you need for a local community, for a smaller country, or even for kind of a smaller subdivisions, like um, places that have biolabs in cities or um, but community biolabs could possibly take part in this. Um, obviously, we're not there yet. We probably won't be able to do it for this particular, for this current pandemic. But assuming we survive it all right and we're still doing science after that, um, we can think of this technology as the next step, as kind of the next way to make um, drugs on demand and to make um, diagnostics and vaccines on demand. And so synthetic cells um, can have many applications in research and many practical applications um, relevant to everyday life. 
So I showed you kind of examples of few, but now I would like to give you kind of an overview of um, the general field, overview of kind of other types of applications. And so for one, understanding natural cells is necessary for building synthetic cells. For engineering cells, we need to understand how natural biology works. And it works the other way around too. Um, if we build understandable synthetic cell life cells, uh, we'll be able to learn a ton about natural life. And similarly, making cells from scratch requires a lot of progress in research technologies, building new bioengineering tools, while having synthetic living cells will be a tool in and out of itself for studying natural biology. And um, some other areas um, of specific applications of synthetic cells are uh, making new biomaterials not found in nature, uh, building biocomputers that run on artificial genetic circuits. Um, we can be using synthetic cells to reconstitute primordial cells and studying the origin and earliest evolution of life. And that includes earliest evolution of life on other planets in a solar system and elsewhere. Um, synthetic cells are basics for astropharmacy applications and can help with a uh, search for life elsewhere in the solar system. And synthetic cells are excellent biofactories for making small molecules and protein products and for developing new metabolic engineering circuits. Also, um, the ability to engineer cell -like cells and cell-like systems is very valuable for studying diseases and for making small amounts of drugs, which will be the foundation of the future kind of field of personalized medicine that I discussed very briefly. Um, and to give you an idea of how the actual synthetic cell looks like, they're big enough that we can use optical microscopy as opposite to needing for the need for super resolution techniques. So here you see microscopy images of um, one and the same synthetic cell. Um, and so that one synthetic cell is imaged um, with three different microscopy settings. The green is green fluorescent protein, uh, showing protein synthesis inside the synthetic cell. The blue is a DNA stain, showing that DNA synthesis, can, uh, DNA of the synthetic cell genome. So this is the DNA stain um, inside the synthetic cell. And the red is a synthetic cell membrane stained um, with a red fluorescent dye. So basically they look like little blobs under the microscope um, that they don't have yet as much kind of an internal morphology like natural cells, but um, we can use them um, for um, kind of a lot of different, at least crude microscopy techniques. So we can image them, we can image their division, we can image their growth, we can image their formation if you're really patient enough. So it's possible to do optical microscopy, although most of the time we do use um, biotechnology, kind of a biochemical spectrophotometrical techniques uh, to really tell what's going on inside the synthetic cell. And um, this is another example of how synthetic cells look under the microscope. Um, synthetic cells encapsulating a live natural cell of a cyanobacteria and the lipids produced by the bacteria make the membrane of a synthetic cell, um, in this video it's dyed red, um, grow. You can see it's slow, the video is um, not sped up in this case, but if you look at this red um, blob, this is a synthetic cell that has a cyanobacteria inside, and that synthetic cell is growing as the lipids from the cyanobacteria, so from the natural life cell, are incorporated into the membrane of the synthetic cell. So it's basically, you can see here how a synthetic cell is using natural cells as those kind of little, um, I don't wanna say slaves, but little, this is what organelles are. They're basically enslaved simpler cells inside a now more complex cell. And the pattern of the growth you see here, um, those little threads, um, that's because there's no way to equilibrate a um, ionic gradient across a synthetic cell membrane between a synthetic cell and the outside. When natural cells grow, um, you see that they grow as spheres. That's because the cells equilibrate the um, osmotic pressure across their membranes as they grow. This particular design of a synthetic cell that, that you see here on a video does not have um, a, it does not have uh, membrane channels that can be used um, for for equilibrating that pressure. 
So they grow as those kind of big threads. If you divide those threads, so basically if you pearl them, they will end up dividing into a daughter cells that are again, after some time, resume their spherical shape. And um, for all these um, space applications I mentioned, um, we recently demonstrated a potential for using synthetic cells for astropharmacy um, by a sunning rocket experiment. I was now launched from NASA Wallops and dem it demonstrated technology readiness level six for this platform um, and making that also made me stay up um, until 4 a.m. to watch uh, my first payload go up to space. So this was really exciting for, for me personally. And this is just one example of the work my lab is doing. Um, so if you're more interested in some specific projects, um, I'm always happy to talk more later. I'm not going to go through um, more kind of experimental details. But just to demonstrate um, this picture here um, on the right side of the screen, that's um, the kind of a reaction chamber payload that went up on a rocket. And the reaction that's happening inside there is demonstrated um, on a proof of principle reaction in a lab on that plate you see above. It's basically production of a fluorescent protein that you can observe um, using ADA spectrophotometrical readouts or in many cases um, kind of with your naked eye. And building synthetic cell, synthetic life cells is a bigger job than one country can support. So what I was talking about before was kind of general overview of the field. And then I gave you kind of a few examples of um, work done in my lab. Um, this is an international affair. Uh, there's not a single lab or a single community or a single country that can build life cells. Um, in many ways, our work is not unlike the high energy particle physics uh, with the need for giant particle accelerators or the need for international support for the space station. Making life from scratch is this giant research and engineering challenge. Um, it's uniting international community and we're organized in this Build a Cell initiative. Uh, so Build a Cell supports group of researchers, ethicists and policymakers exploring the ways to build and to safely use uh, synthetic cells. And the backbone of our community are in-person interactions. Um, we're meeting twice a year at Build a Cell workshops. We have weekly international virtual seminars uh, that you're all invited to um, with recordings of those seminars available online so anyone can go in and look even if you can't make the seminar time itself. Uh, we have year-round working groups preparing policy guidelines and shared protocols. And we're training students and we're growing connections with other fields to make some of those applications I was talking about distributed to the broader scientific community. We also talk to the public about engineering synthetic cells. And if anyone is interested, you can always join a working group. You don't have to be a member of a lab or you don't have to be a member of a lab that is a member of a builder cell. If you personally think you have something to contribute to this community or you want to learn more about building cells, you want to learn more about international collaborations, international community, how, how this kind of model of sharing scientific results across the international community, you can always join um, a working group at Build a Cell. You don't have to be a member. You can basically volunteer and come to our meetings um, anytime you want um, with no kind of no strings attached. You can come, you can listen. If you feel like this is not for you, you can then leave. Um, we're trying to be as inclusive and open as possible to different approaches to research. So we have people doing um, kind of approaching the problems of synthetic cells from um, a lot of different perspectives. And um, the ultimate goal of our community is to build a synthetic living organism collaborating across those geographical and institutional boundaries. And we really want people from different universities in different countries to work together, contributing um, to solving this biggest puzzle of biology and building international distributed network of laboratories engineering living cells. And hopefully to me, um, this is the future of biotechnology. The end result that is a fully understandable synthetic living cell and the existence of united international community. Um, I think we have to think of this problem as an international problem. This is not something that one country can work on or even a group of countries. Um, this is a problem that um, is not just an academic research problem because the whole world needs those bioengineering solutions. We need to be able to make drugs. We need to be able to make molecules in a sustainable way. 
And especially once we run out of petrochemicals, when we run out of oil, we need bioengineering platforms that will let us produce all those things that we right now produce from oil. So this is kind of not just a um, interesting, fascinating research problem, but it's also something that directly touches every one of us because we need technologies that don't exist right now. And so long story short, we need to make those technologies. And we also want to train researchers um, in this field that's operating across geographical boundaries. So we can build a new model of scientific collaboration. We can say, um, I don't care that my lab is here and your lab is over there across the, an ocean. We should work together. And if we find something to work together on, we should be able to work together. And so in the last kind of last few centuries, um, you know, we went from engineering in steel to engineering electrons. And now biological engineering is catching up finally. Um, we're building synthetic cells and we're right now moving on to the next step of using biological parts to engineer those new types of life and to understand our own biological life um, much better. So that's the end of, of my talk. I want to thank um, everyone. Um, thank all the people in my lab, thank all the funding uh, funding support that my lab gets. Um, and if anyone um, has any questions, I would be happy to answer. And thank you all. Um, so should I just go through the questions um, that I see in the chat or do you want to moderate? They're going to appear below um, in a okay. Yes. So I see I see questions in, in um in chat in the streaming window. Um should I just start going through them or yeah, sure. Okay, um so I'll, I'll start in the, I guess, in the reverse chronological order. Um, so I'll read the question um, if someone doesn't see the chat. Um, so does computational biology relate to synthetic biology? If yes, how? Um, absolutely, it relates. It tells us what to do, basically. Um, computational biologists um, study this kind of intricate network of uh, genetic, genetic circuits, biological circuits, um, and studies and information that we get from computational biology studies can actually inform the way um, we build cells. So yes, relates very much and um, it's a kind of integral part of the efforts to build cells. Okay, so next question is, is it possible to use synthetic cells in clinical trials for drugs? Um, Right now, no, because we don't have synthetic cells that would model an actual patient um, reliably. The thing about clinical trials is they run to account for things that we don't know. So basically, you make a drug, you study it in vitro, and then you put it in a clinical trial to see how it works on an actual living patient. And for that, synthetic cells are not really good yet because we can't really recreate the complexity of an actual patient. What synthetic cells are good for is um, earlier R&D stage of drug development. You can make synthetic cells that you use for um, uh, developing a drug, for um, studying interactions of the drug with other pathways, but eventually you still have to put it in a patient so that there's Right now, there's really no way around clinical trials for now. So could synthetic cells replace the use of stem cells in the future? I sure hope so. Um, we make synthetic cells right now that have the ability to differentiate into lineages, kind of independent lineages. And so that's one of the goals um, of the future is that one day we'll be able to make cells on demand that can then turn or differentiate into whatever lineages we want um, to create new tissues or to provide all those benefits that stem cell research is providing right now. Um, is there any ethical concern to get attention while using synthetic cells like the use of stem cells? Um, 
That's a very difficult question. Um, definitely stem cells because they're engineered from scratch. They, there's no ethical concerns in harvesting them or there's no source concerns. Uh, the biggest source of the ethical considerations in synthetic cells field right now is the gain of function research concerns. So basically we're all stuck at home right now because of the gain of function, because a virus acquired a new function. Um, when you think about it, building cells from scratch is the ultimate gain of function research because you're taking something that's not living and you're making it living. Um, this is something that we discuss in the community is how to implement biosafety and biosecurity um, into our research at this very early stage. And this is the biggest kind of ethics concern is how do we do this research safely and responsibly. So when it comes to producing synthetic cells, is there any protocol or license that is needed to be accepted first? Um, no, there's no license. Um, we keep all the protocols um, as open as possible, uh, especially in build a cell. We have um, this kind of a, almost a rule that everything we produce as a build a cell community, so all the protocols, all the research reports have to be open source available. Uh, so there are obviously areas of this um, research that do end up under IP. Um, there's no other way to get industry money into our community unless we patent some stuff. But the basic research is open. Um, most labs in a field, if you want to get into that field, you can email everyone and ask for explanations to their protocols. It's a very open kind of friendly community. So you can get started um, anytime you want, basically. There's no license to do any of that work. Um, can synthetic cells themselves can synthetic cells themselves like natural cells, uh, I guess you mean behave themselves, um, can we replace them with any damaged natural cell? Um, not yet. Uh, synthetic cells, the really simple ones, are not yet interchangeable with any possible life cell. Um, there are some applications where you can, but most of the time, um, that's kind of the problem in biotechnology right now, is we cannot engineer any given cell. That's where the field is kind of going, is we do want to be able to eventually be able to replace any natural cell with an engineered cell, but we're not there yet. Uh, can synthetic cells divide themselves like natural cells? Can we replace any damaged natural cell with synthetic cell in treatment of certain diseases? So the first part of your question, um, synthetic cells can divide, but they cannot self-replicate yet. Um, that's kind of a crucial difference you can divide synthetic cells, um, so we can divide them experimentally, but we cannot um, yet make them to self-replicate. So basically the processes inside the synthetic cell cannot induce replication, but replication can be induced experimentally. And I think I answered the second part of that question, um, answering the previous question. Uh, does synthetic biology systems take into account for unpredictable biological phenomena such, such as mutations? Um, yes, uh, we love mutations. Um, that can, might kind of sound weird, but mutations is the way evolution works. Um, we're not smart enough to figure out everything that life took four billion years to figure out. Um, so we need mutations to be able to evolve cells. Um, we need mutations to be able to engineer biological systems. And we definitely embrace mutations in a synthetic cell because that means mutations in their backbone of Darwinian evolution. And we want synthetic cells to undergo Darwinian evolution eventually. So we do like mutations. Um, sometimes in some experiments when mutations rates are too high, that obviously causes problems. But generally, um, mutations are a good thing in this, in this research. Um, how does genetic engineering fit in synthetic biology? Um, what are the goals of synthetic biology in this area and how SynLife is fulfilling them? So genetic engineering um, is, to me at least, the backbone of synthetic biology because synthetic biology was created, the field kind of was created to be able to engineer cells, to be able to understand natural cells and to be able to engineer them to do whatever we want. And genetic engineering is a subset of bioengineering. Um, you're engineering genes, and that's what genetic engineering is. Um, you can also engineer whole living systems, and that's what synthetic cell building is. And this is all under this broad umbrella of synthetic biology, which is a discipline that lets you control biological systems and 
change them to do whatever you need. Um, SynLife doesn't really do genetic engineering. We're a very boring um, drug-oriented company. The goals of SynLife as a company is to put a drug on the market. That's plain and simple. Um, we're not, through the company, we're not having any kind of worthy synthetic biology goals. Um, this is kind of more that genetic engineering and synthetic biology, this is more of an academic part of my lab. And this is what I'm really you know, excited for as an academic, as a researcher. So the next question is, um, what is the predicted vision concerning the field of astrobiology? Well, the my vision is that we'll 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 go to Mars and grow potatoes there one day. Um, the thing about astrobiology is that it's hard to predict anything because, for one, we don't know what we'll find. Um, like the discovery of of phosphines on Venus last week, um, this shows you how unpredictable and how still controversial that field is. But on the other hand, um, there is a lot of kind of technological and unfortunately political boundaries because space exploration is a kind of a political issue and, un and not all governments agree, not all governments have the resources to actually go out there, to send people out there. Um, and even if we do, um, the first kind of first trust will be motivated by um, not just research curiosity, but also kind of practical applications. So my guess is astrobiology will be growing um, faster and faster as we actually start doing long term space missions. Um, in our lifetime, we probably will only see a small Mars colony, but hopefully, um, you know, within the next century or so, we'll actually be able to study those places where life could exist in a solar system and then maybe um, astrobiology will become biology because we'll actually find life somewhere out there. So is it possible to make human organs from synthetic cells? Um, and then kind of related question, could synthetic cells replace prosthetics? Not yet, unfortunately. Um, synthetic cells are still um, more of a basic research and bioengineering tool. Um, that kind of goes back to the stem cell question that I had before. Um, it would one day be possible I hope to grow synthetic cells to differentiate into any types of cells, but not right now, not yet. Um, would you love to be an advisor of community of biotechnology? We are really interested in your work. Oh, thank you very much. That's really sweet. Um, I love to advise uh, community biotech spaces. I am, I've done workshops for community biotech, um, for kind of citizens bio places, um, mostly here in the US um, and a little bit in Europe. And so I would love to talk more um, we can also, if you do hands-on workshops, I don't know if you do that right now during the pandemic or later, but um, we've been sending reagents to community biolabs. Um, so we can send you reagents completely for free. We cover shipping. Um, we can basically send you reagents to do self-free protein expression experiments, transcription experiments, and some kind of basic synthetic cell experiments. So I'm always happy to talk more. So next question. Synthetic biology is comparatively a newer approach. Is there any regulatory policy to prevent the unethical or potentially harmful applications of associated with to this field? Um, very good question. Thank you for, so much for it. Um, right now, there is no regulatory body that regulates um, synthetic cell engineering. And this is something we are working on right now. Um, we, as the build a cell, one of our goals is to do community and policy outreach. And part of the policy outreach is to going out to the lawmakers and saying, here's this field, it needs to be regulated. And we're telling you that as people that actually do this work, we want guidance, um, we want regulations. And synthetic biology as a whole is, starting to be regulated. There are bits and pieces in different countries. Um, obviously, my, from my pers perspective, I know I'm more, most familiar with the European and uh, US regulations, but most countries have some sort of a regulation on synthetic DNA. That's the part that's the most regulated right now. Um, but um, right now, we don't have kind of a worldwide strategy for regulating synthetic biology or synthetic cell research, and we definitely need one. Is it possible, so next question, is it possible to make synthetic lens for eyes? Um, that goes back to the prosthetics and stem cell question. Unfortunately, not yet. One day, maybe we will, but not yet. So the next question is, um, what, 
what are the relations of synthetic biology and astrobiology? So to me, they're um, orthogonal and kind of op somewhat overlapping disciplines. Um, synthetic biology helps provide tools for astrobiology, for looking for life elsewhere and for astropharmacy and for um, kind of making uh, life models that then can inform how are we going to be looking for life elsewhere. Um, synthetic biology also provides tools for origin of life studies. So for figuring out how life started on Earth and that will give us information about how life could have started elsewhere, like on Mars or on Europa or on Enceladus or even on Venus. Uh, can synthetic cells be defined as living? That's a tricky question. Um, that depends on your definition of life. Um, what is living for you? And this is an incredibly difficult question because there is no scientifically solid, recognizable, unarguable definition of life right now. It seems like there should be one, but whenever we come up with a definition of life, um, someone finds an example that doesn't fit with it. So, for example, um, the, the very commonly used in a field is the NASA definition of life, which is a synthetic chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. And if you think about it, that is a very good uh, uh, definition from the kind of systems biology standpoint. But when you look at a single human that never made, never had children, that person, according to the NASA definition of life, is not alive. Because if you're not self-replicating, then you're not undergoing Darwinian evolution. And so that shows you the shortcomings of that, um, that and all other definitions of life. So having said that, I think right now the top-down approach to synthetic cells produces living synthetic cells. Like the JCVI synthetic cell is definitely living. The bottom-up approach does not yet produce um, living cells. Uh, it produces very understandable, engineerable systems, but at least according to my private uh, working definition, they're not yet alive. Um, some people argue they are, but that's still you know, up for debate. So next question, can we regenerate the burned part of body by using synthetic biology? And that goes back to prosthetics and islands and um, stem cells. Unfortunately, not yet. Hopefully one day we'll be able to do regenerative medicine um, with engineered cells, but we're not there yet. Um, next question, what are the implications of synthetic biology in present and future food production? Um, in present, not much because we're still better at growing plants than engineering plants from scratch. In the future, um, we're hoping that definitely a lot of nutrients, especially high value, um, low volume nutrients will be able to be produced um, using engineered cells. And next question, um, at the state of the art, is it possible to recreate synthetic eukaryotic subcellular compartments like ER, Golgi or PTMSs? Um, for the PTMSs, the answer is yes. Um, we can do glycosidation, we can do um, disulfide bonds. We're pretty good at that right now. Um, for the subcellular compartments, um, we do try, definitely. There's a really good review on that from the Max Planck people called, I think it's titled, What What Synthetic Cells Look Like, or something like that, um, that came out last year. And it shows that there's a lot of progress done already. We can make subcellular compartments. Um, they're not as robust as natural cell compartments yet, but we're definitely working on it. And people are capable of making things that sort of look like it already. Um, that video that I showed you during the talk, that growing perling synthetic cell, that had a bacteria cell, a cyanobacteria inside it. So in a way you can think of a cyanobacteria as a compartment of a synthetic cell. So the next question is, um, how much predictable is the behavior of the most minimal synthetic cell? Um, very predictable because they're so simple. That's kind of the, the goal of this work is to build cells that we can understand and we can predict their behaviors. Um, the thing is, it doesn't do much behavior yet. Um, it's still very simple. So um, we can predict what it does, but it doesn't do as many interesting things as we, as we would want it to do yet. Uh, next question, what are the biggest challenges that uh, may be faced in a building of a synthetic cell? Um, right now, definitely self-replication and replication of the genetic material. 
Um, these are the biggest challenges for now. Um, long term, the biggest challenge would be um, making it bio orthogonal enough that it's safe and making it robust enough that you can use it in, in the wild, that you can use it in the nature. So next question, can we build genetic circuits that would operate in individual cells to detail how repression or regulation RNA changes, especially in the context of therapeutic use? Um, yes, this is actually one of the things that my lab and some other labs are working on right now. Um, we are using um, regulatory RNA models in synthetic cells um, to study basically how uh, st how structures like that work, how um, pathways are upregulated or downregulated by those regulatory oligos. Uh, next question, can synthetic biology be used to treat al Alzheimer and neural diseases? Um, I wanna say eventually yes, but right now we don't really know um, what do we need to do to treat Alzheimer. Um, you know, we know that amyloid plaque exists, but we don't know how to target it. There's many drugs that people, uh, try to use to target it, but we don't really know the mechanism underlying the disease. So it's really hard right now to speculate about how we're going to treat it. Um, one day, yes, hopefully. Next question. Uh, do our body adapt with synthetic cells easily to take it as a foreign substance and give side effects? So there have not been um, human studies with the completely synthetic cells. Uh, most that we done, we've done in human studies was with synthetic bacterial cells. With the synthetic with the really synthetic cells, the bottom-up cells, um, there have been mouse studies. And we can see that the mouse immune system does not detect synthetic cells as a foreign object. That's due to the composition of the membrane. We designed the membrane of a synthetic cell in a way that it doesn't get flagged as a foreign object. So it is possible to think about using synthetic cells for either drug delivery or production of drugs in the body because they are stealth to the immune system. A next question, a future of synthetic biology for the betterment of society. Yes, sign me up. Um, I definitely think um, synthetic biology is the next step in engineering. Um, there are many problems right now that we cannot deal with using current engineering approaches and current kind of biological engineering approaches. We need a better approach and we need to work as an international community. That's as, as big as a science to me is that we can't have a few countries um, take charge um, and developing something that then all, all other countries are expected to use. Um, everyone should be involved in doing it. And so here's the kind of hell yes answer. Yes, we should be doing it. And the result of what we're doing will hopefully benefit everyone in the society, just like the results of the technical technological revolutions. So, um, Next question, would you like to briefly explain what is teleportation of biology you mentioned in your lecture? So this was, this was the, the word teleportation was obviously used more as a joke, um, but the idea is that um, you can digitize a biological system, in this case, a synthetic cell. So you can write down the composition of a synthetic cell as bits, as a series of bits, and then you can send that information to a remote location where this particular biological system gets reconstituted. Um, and so you cannot do that with a natural cell because you cannot um, send a natural cell like that, but you can do that with a synthetic cell. And so that's kind of what we mean when we say kind of teleportation. Um, so next question, um, in other planetary systems, can we get same biology like Earth using synthetic biology? Um, I don't think it will be same. If we, for example, build a cell that's capable of living on uh, in Martian soil, it will look different than our um, modern terrestrial cell, but it will definitely be biology. It will be living, it will be replicating, metabolizing. So yes, I think synthetic biology can be used to make um, cells operate on other planets. Um, and right now, I, I, I can only think of Mars because this is the, the only planet we're you know, likely to settle anytime soon. But generally, yes, if we go out and try to settle other planets, we can engineer cells to adapt to those environments. Um, so next question, um, can we cure some ment... Oh, wait, I think I answered that one already. Um, oh, OK, this one. Uh, when you have mentioned that synthetic cells can self-replicate, then how could we think of using this as an alternative to stem cells for our future cancer treatments? 
What is the actual methodology it works on? Could you please give a brief on this? Um, so synthetic cells cannot replicate right now, but that doesn't mean they never will. Um, this is one of the kind of the fastest moving um, research areas. Um, we are building synthetic cells that can grow already. And there are labs that build um, a replication machinery that starts to bleb synthetic cells. So you can have a cell that kind of starts to look like it's about to divide. We can have the compression rings already. So my guess is within, you know, next couple years, and by couple, I literally mean two, um, we will see an actual self-replicating synthetic cell. So this, they can't replicate right now is just yet because we're working on it and it's moving fast. So next question, are synthetic cells immortal like cancer cells or will they die eventually? Um, right now they will eventually die because they don't self-replicate. Um, we replicate them, we feed them. And so that's how we can keep them going for a long time. Once they start self-replicating, um, the current synthetic cell genomes don't have telomeres. So there's no kind of aging mechanism in them. So yes, they should be able to just keep replicating unless we stop it, unless we put some kind of stop in it. So next question, um, how contribution of systems biology to synthetic biology? Um, systems biology is to, I might offend some systems biologists right now, but to me, that's a subset of synthetic biology because synthetic biology encompasses any way of manipulating biological systems. And systems biology defines those systems, helps us understand what should we work on. So in a way, they're part of kind of two sides of the same coin. We want to manipulate biology. That's what synthetic biology is. And we need to understand it to be able to manipulate it. And that's what systems biology brings. The so next question. To date, most genetic therapies, whether they are synthetic or otherwise, target small mutations. Do you think synthetic biology, in a broader sense, can facilitate us targeting large lesions in the genome? Um, yes, definitely. Um, there's a lot of work being done right now on it. And um, kind of a this large genome scale manipulations is something that um, definitely synthetic biology will be able to address um, once we learn how to address smaller mutations. Addressing larger mutations is basically the, the, the increasing the size of a payload of a DNA we're delivering. So it's I don't want to say it's trivial, but it's it it boils boils down to a technical problem, which we're as a community pretty good at solving. So next question, is it possible to get control over evolution and ecology using synthetic biological techniques? Um, it unfortunately probably yes, and I sure hope we never do that because it's a terrible idea. Um, we should, we've ruined our biology, we've ruined our ecology in so many ways um, that we really should not mess with it any further. Um, if you look at Australia and their um, brilliant experiments with rabbits, foxes, and whatnot that they introduced to their ecosystem. Um, if you looked at all the invasive species that we have now all over Europe and the United States, we should not mess with ecology. So the fact that we can, and we probably can, synthetic biology has some techniques, for example, gene drive, that do that is already capable of creating ecological whole biosphere-wide changes. We really should not be doing it. Um, we're not good at it. We're not that smart. We don't know what will the effects be. So even though, for example, an idea of let's kill our mosquitoes sounds great because mosquitoes carry diseases and they're terrible. If we kill all the mosquitoes, there are fundamental changes in the ecosystem. The animals that feed on mosquitoes, the ecosystems that support mosquitoes will change. And we don't know how. And I guarantee you this is not going to be a good change. So even though we can change um, whole eco ecosystems, we really should not. OK, next question. Um, until now, what is the application of synthetic biology in our life? Um, biological drugs is one thing I can think of. Um, if you take um, any autoimmune biological drugs, for example, for um, rheumatoid arthritis or for Crohn's disease, um, also cancer therapies, um, stem cell cancer therapies or CAR T cells. This is all applications of synthetic biology. Um, the fact that we can treat cancers that we couldn't treat even 20 years ago, that's all thanks to the synthetic biology being able to do that. Um, then biomanufacturing. Um, we are right now able to make a lot of different compounds in those bio, bio large vats, and that's kind of coming from the early days of synthetic biology and biological engineering. Um, 
Okay, next. Uh, what is the possibility of using synthetic biology to design organisms that can consume toxic chemicals in ocean? Um, pretty high, hopefully. Um, we're working on it right now um, in my lab and other people are working on it too, is um, bioremediation is a big problem. And we can engineer cells um, that will be able to kind of um, go into the go into the wild, go into the um, uh, oceans, rivers, and be able to hopefully um, help with bioremediation, especially of um, oil spills or um, heavy metal contaminations. So um, next question, what is the difference between synthetic biology and genome ed editing? Um, it's not a difference. Uh, genome editing is just a subset of synthetic biology. We edit genomes to edit whole organisms. And so genome editing is kind of a subfield of synthetic biology. So next question, is it possible to design biosensor cells to sense the biodistribution of um, DNA, RNA like drug molecules, which would be non-invasive and at the same time quantify the role of the drug in expression modulation? Like, do we have any technology for that at present? Um, at present, unfortunately, no, um, we don't. This is something that people do work on, and this is this would be extremely useful tools. So um, this is something that um, uh, people are working on, but right now we don't know how to do it. Uh, next question, can we cure Down syndrome or something like those genetical diseases? Um, no, and I don't think we ever will, uh, because those fundamental chromosomal um, aberrations, they affect too much. And by the time the, ch the child is born, the developmental changes has been have been too deep. So I don't think we'll ever be able to cure um, whole body chromosomal ab abnormal abnormalities like that in a living person. Um, we might be able to cure it on a on the embryonic level but i don't think we'll ever be able to do it for a living person um hello professor if someone wants to join your team what will be the procedure um so most of the time we take graduate students from uh the two university of minnesota grad programs also undergrads at the university of minnesota are always welcome in our lab um we also hire postdocs so if someone is on the market as a postdoc um I would be very happy to talk. Um, right now, unfortunately, because of COVID, we have a hiring freeze. So the university doesn't let me hire anyone outside of the university. So I can only take students that are already here at the university, but that hopefully will change soon. Um, next question. Um, can we use synthetic biology to somehow engineer the microbiomes inside the human body, purposing to treat several personal personalized disorders relevant to the microbiome? Yes, we can. And there are companies that do it already. Um, there's a lot of academic labs doing it, but there's also it's it advanced to the point that I know of at least two startups that are planning to engineer the microbiome, the gut microbiome, and then um, either produce nutrients or produce small molecules that we think microbiome interact. So that's definitely doable and people are doing it already. So next question, what are the risks of synthetically modified organisms being released into the environment? Um, there's many risks, and that's why um, we cannot just be releasing a synthetic organism without fail safes. That's what the whole field of um, biosafety, biosecurity is about. Um, we can't just go and release whatever we made in the lab into the environment. We have to put um, fail safes into it, so we have to put in um, either gene switches or nutrient switches that Want, that will prevent that organism from replicating in the environment. And so that's what we're doing right now. And hopefully we will never see a synthetic cell just released into the environment um, wildly. Um, right now, this technology is not robust enough to survive. But when it is, um, we hopefully will be smart enough to prevent that. Um, next question is, um, is it happen to replace disease cells by synthetic biology? Um, not yet, but one day, hopefully, we will. Um, next comment. Thank you very much. I'm glad you liked it. Um, the next one, um, suppose we want to design a synthetic vector system for therapeutic genes that would self-destruct once it precisely incorporates the DNA fragments within the host genome. Can we load multiple therapies, one RNA-based drug and uh, corticosteroid in a single vector? What would be the challenges to overcome? Um, I mean, in terms of hepatonephrotoxicity, do you think the design would be safe enough? 
Um, not right now, because the way we introduce um, payloads into the genome is by viruses most of the time, and we don't have L antivirus that would have such a large payload. Um, it would technically should one day be doable with synthetic cells, but we don't know how to do it right now yet. But there are people working on it. Um, not necessarily my lab, but there are people working on kind of large genome drug delivery. Um, and so this hopefully will be a solved problem one day. Um, as there is no telomere in the synthetic cells genome, does it indicate higher rate of mutation due to duplication errors? Um, right now, no, because our replication methods are very tailored to the specific genome. Once we have a complex synthetic cell, hopefully, yes, we will be um, having higher mutation rates. And that's good because we'll evolve faster, but then we'll have to be able to um, counter those high mutation rates. So that's kind of be the, another area of research at that point. Um, is, now, next question, is there any side effect if we induce synthetic cells into our body or organs? Um, we don't know yet because we haven't done it. Um, once we do it, my guess is yes, because there's side effects to anything we put into the body. The hope is that the side effects will be less bad um, than um, the benefits of each of those therapies. Next question, is it possible to solve human allergy problems using synthetic biology? Oh gosh, I wish we could. Um, I have seasonal allergies that I hate. I wish we could solve it. Right now, I don't think we can because the immune system is so hard to mess with. Um, you really don't wanna get your immune system out of whack because autoimmune diseases are just the worst thing. So right now, I don't know of anyone working on allergy treatments, but I wouldn't be surprised if someone eventually does because it is such a big problem. Um, very informative session, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, and the last question, is it possible to make synthetic cells to store digital data? Yes, it is. Um, this is actually one of the pr projects right now that I, I do and other people in the field do. There is this whole bio, in, bio um, computing field, um, at least in the US, it's pretty well funded by um, Semiconductor Research Corporation and other kind of big company funded um, research initiatives. We do look at ways um, to store digital data um, in genomes and do biological logic gates, so kind of biological computation and retrieval of that data. Okay, last question. Um, what is the most evolutionary invention that you are planning to deal with using synthetic biology in the future? Um, would you share, actually wanted to know about how do you think stuff's about the best application of synthetic biology could be in the future? Um, to me, the best application will be bioproduction. Because when you think about it, um, we have a lot of technologies that help us deal with energy, um, with renewable energy. So when we switch from a economy that runs on or that runs on oil to the economy that runs on renewable energy sources, will be good. We have solar panels, we have nuclear energy, we have wind energy. We have this technology. We just have to spread it all across the world. I'm not saying this is easy, but it's doable. That technology exists. What we don't have is a technology to replace petrochemicals. Um, all those chemicals that we right now get from oil, we still cannot synthesize them biologically. And so when we run out of oil, everyone thinks it will be an energy problem. We solved that energy problem already. We just have to give those solutions to everyone who right now relies on oil. But um, we don't have a solution to the petrochemical problems. And so to me, that's the biggest area of synthetic biology applications in the future is how do we replace those petrochemicals? How do we make all the chemicals that our industry needs right now in a renewable way? Um, thank you. Oh, um, okay, now really last question. Astrobiology is my dream field and I wish to study and work. How should I prepare myself to work in astrobiology? Well, um, so my, I'm personally, I started out as a chemist. Um, I completely, there is no specific field that you need to study to become an astrobiologist. Um, it's such a diverse, wide discipline that any undergrad you do in any kind of a STEM field can prepare you to do a PhD in any other area of astrobiology. So I would suggest um, find um, if an area of astrobiology that you're the most interested in. Is it synthetic biology or origin of life or explorations or geochemistry or astrochemistry? 
or any other of the fields that are related to astrobiology and then you can specialize in that but you can again also switch fields at any time so um, good luck with that and thank you i want to thank everyone for a great discussion and thank you all for having me here So if there's no more questions, um, thank you all. And if anyone has any more questions, you can um, look me up and send me an email anytime you want. So thanks again. <laughs>